And then risk management predictors, lack of supervision and monitoring after re release. So this would be like for a juvenile, uh, parental supervision. For adults, that would be probation or parole. Easy access to victims, drugs, alcohol, and weapons. A lack of social support or resources. Medication non-compliance, this is a huge one. Um, don't think that just mentally ill people are dangerous because the most dangerous people out there are not mentally ill. Uh, mental illness does not make you dangerous, but when somebody is mentally ill and they have the capacity for uh, violence, typically they've been medicated and when they're released they don't follow through with their medication so they can decompensate really quickly. And then the last one is stress in the family, employment, or peer relations. Uh, again, a past history of violence is one of the most powerful indicators of future violence. So remember that. Substance abuse, um, drugs, and alcohol are major contributors to violence amongst both mentally disordered and non-mentally disordered individuals. Do not think that drugs or alcohol make you violent. Uh, that's kind of a myth. What they can do is facilitate violence. And the number one offender here, you might think it's like crack cocaine, something like that. The number one offender here is alcohol. So alcohol doesn't make you violent. Alcohol fa facilitates violence. And not all drugs make you violent. That's another myth too. So think about like marijuana. Historically people have thought that that contributed to violence. That's probably not exactly true. And um, however, uh, alcohol again, major major contributor to violence. It doesn't make you violent, it just facilitates violence. Um, so we have high rates of substance abuse in the incarcerated population and if you look at uh, self-reports of those individuals that are incarcerated, they have really high rates of self-reporting that they were intoxicated at the time that they committed their crimes. Um, so it's a very important risk factor. And if someone is psychotic, um, if someone has a diagnosis of like schizophrenia, uh, it's really a bad idea for those individuals to be abusing any substances whatsoever. And so a typical scenario that I've seen is that someone will stabilize in a hospital and then they'll be released. The first thing that they do is they go get alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, and that really can destabilize somebody that has uh, psychosis. So there are psychiatric diagnoses that are associated with violence. However, here things aren't quite as clear as you think. A lot of students think that just because somebody's diagnosed with schizophrenia that makes them violent. And there was early research that linked violence with schizophrenia. Um, but the research isn't really conclusive about that. Um, there have been recent meta-analyses that suggest that the risk of violence is threefold among those with psychosis, but I don't like to use meta-analyses. I like to use primary data um, because the articles that actually get published are the ones that are interesting. And if you can link schizophrenia to violence, that's got a better chance of getting published, and that article will end up in the meta-analysis not the article that says, oh, there's really no link here. So just remember that this is inconclusive. But I like to look at the psychiatric symptoms versus a diagnosis, because the symptoms can sometimes give you more information about dangerousness. Now, the historical symptoms that we have looked at in relationship to violence are mania, like uh, with bipolar disorder, depression, hallucinations, and delusions. So let's go into those three areas. Mania, um, again, you'll find mania uh, associated with bipolar disorder or schizoaffective disorder. You can have a bipolar presentation. And this is a distinct period of abnormal and persistently elevated mood um, that is expansive or irritable in nature. So people 
uh, like this is depressed down here, this is normal here, mania is above normal, like I'm feeling really, really good. That's called a manic episode. So people might have an inflated self-esteem, they might start talking really fast, they might have pressured speech, uh, they might need uh, less sleep than normal, they might have a flight of ideas, their ideas are bouncing around, they might actually get a lot of work done. They might do um, some things that are self-destructive, they might engage in excessively pleasurable activities, they might have uh, uh, indiscriminate sexual relationships, they might go on shopping sprees, uh, they might invest money in a foolish manner, there's lots of things uh, that people that have mania might do. Um, uh, some of the uh, mania stories that I like, and actually when you see somebody that's manic, it's, it's kind of scary. Um, and like if you go to New York City and you see those guys that uh, come on the subway and they might have tinfoil wrapped around their head and they're talking really fast and you can't understand them, typically that's a manic episode, not psychosis. So when you are manic, you can have delusions at that time or hallucinations if you're really manic. Um, but more likely it's just that excessive amount of energy and self-destructive behavior. So I heard a story about a woman that took uh, all her savings, uh, this is a while back when Beanie Babies were popular, and she bought $30,000 worth of Beanie Babies as an investment. I heard another story about a woman in New York. Uh, she went to this pet store called Pets on Lex and uh, they have like, you know, puppies in there and she decided that she wanted to buy puppies. And so she called the limousine company, had the limousine come pick her up and she bought all the puppies in the store and then drove around Manhattan with like 20 puppies in the limousine. Uh, it might sound funny, actually to me it kind of sounds like fun, um, but this manic episode can get people into a lot of trouble. Now, it can result in threatening and assaultive behavior, but research has shown that uh, serious intentional violence is actually quite rare. Now, depression, we know what depression is. Depression is a depressed mood for most of the day, nearly every day, um, that's going to last for at least a two week period. People might have, they call it anhedonia or lack of pleasure, diminished interest in activities, weight loss or weight gain, insomnia or hypersomnia, sleeping too much, psychomotor agitation or like retardation, they're slowing down, they're not moving around, fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, cognitive disturbances like diminished ability to think, and recurrent thoughts of death. So in depression, violence can either be self-directed, like suicide, we're, we're always cautious of that, or directed to others. And here it's usually others that are close to that individual. So sometimes you run that risk. And you'll see this a lot in people, this is severe, severe depression. Um, so don't you know, this is not like the depression that we all feel when we have a lousy day. That's normal depression. This is serious clinical depression. Like Andrea Yates, who had postpartum depression, who killed her children. And, you know, when you get really, really, really depressed, you can have psychotic features at that time, too. But you see stories of, of depressed people that will kill family members and then kill themselves.